All right, and we're going to go ahead and begin. This is an exam review for Survey 2. Uh, during the second half of the survey class, we looked at modern art, so none of the material earlier in the class will be on the exam. So just everything from after the midterm to our last class meeting. This will include the movie My Kid Could Paint That, starring Marla Olmsted and her family. And then we also recently watched the Jackson Pollock documentary about Terry Horton. So there will also be questions and perhaps an essay on this material here. So please make sure that you've gone through and watched that documentary. We began the class looking at photography and photography is really what changes the world and puts the modern art movements into progress. You are responsible for knowing the birth date of photography. It is August 19th. I'll provide that for you on the exam. But what you need to remember is 1839. That is the year photography is invented. The precursors to the camera, we had talked about both the silhouette machine, but more importantly, the camera obscura. The camera obscura is a Latin term. It translates into dark room. And originally, these were room-sized chambers set out in the landscape. A small hole or aperture on the side of the structure, just a pinhole is really about all it is. And it transmits an image of the outside world onto the inside wall where the image would then be traced. Over a period of time, these became smaller, portable, fitted with true lenses and mirrors to make the tracing easier. As far as who invents photography, remember that is lots of people. People like Nisiphor Niepce, who gave us heliography, or William Henry Fox Talbot, who gives us photogenic drawing. But the person who gets credit for the invention of photography is Louis-Jacques Mondeguerre. He's the one that stands up in front of the Academy of Sciences and Academy of Fine Arts in Paris and tells the world what photography is. He even gets to name the very first process after himself, the daguerreotype. With as wonderful as photography is, keep in mind that there's still some major drawbacks. As we can see in this image, it doesn't look like there's anyone in this town that is deserted. However, it is teeming with people, carriages, horses. Unfortunately, they are all in motion. We have a very long exposure time that we need for the image to set. So it's about 20 to 30 seconds at this time. And that's how long these objects need to stand still in order to be captured. This is a unique image, meaning that there's only one of them. If you do want another image of this street corner, you do have to make, take another photograph. And another disadvantage is the use of mercury in the development process. The photographic doc publications you need to know about, we have The Pencil of Nature by William Henry Fox Talbot. This is the very first book of photographs ever published. How the Other Half Lives, first published in 1892 by Jacob Rees. This is a commentary on social issues within um, New York at the time. It's uh, looking at the living conditions that the poor had to endure. And finally, Life Magazine. This was the primary outlet for American photographers for well over 30 years. Photography as entertainment, we have the stereoscope and stereo card. Photography as science, I put on a chrono photograph, a photograph of time, it plots the body's movement. Photography as documentation, this is the image of Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange, who really humanizes the Great Depression. Photography as politics. This is the image of Abraham Lincoln taken by Matthew Brady when Lincoln was only a senator. Photography as social reform. We have Lewis Hines' contribution where he gets jobs at factories, mills, and mines under 
false names when he's really working for the National Committee on Child Labor. And these images uh, show children not actively being abused, but working in very dangerous conditions for long periods of time, for very little money. And this is the basis for our child labor laws today. Photography is Feminism, that's Cindy Sherman and her untitled film still series of the late 1970s and early 1980s, showing women um, as they're depicted in film and television advertising, which is the woman playing the role of the victim. Don't forget that Cindy Sherman is not only uh, the photographer, she is also the person in this photo. And finally, photography is art. So we do acknowledge that there is an aesthetic value of art. And I chose Timothy O'Sullivan's image here when he's working for the US Geological Survey crew after the Civil War. Make sure to know about Edward Manet. He is the father of modern art. And don't confuse him with Claude Monet, who is the leader of Impressionism. They were contemporaries, they knew each other, they were friends, um, however, totally different people. So what happens with modernism, it's that we're throwing away all the old conventions that were established during the Renaissance, items that we covered during the first part of the class, such as linear perspective and chiaroscuro. Another term during this part of the semester is avant-garde. This is a term that we apply to not only artists, but also artworks that are considered to be innovative and experimental. So Edward Manet, very wealthy individual, is the person who paints the famous work Luncheon on the Grass. Again, this is an image you definitely need to know for the exam. It is the ultimate image of modern art. Even though it's very tame by today's standards, it really was groundbreaking in 1863. It was not allowed into the normal salon, but instead it was placed in the Salon of the Refuse, the Salon de Refuse of the same year. There are many things that are not considered academic about this painting. For instance, the chiaroscuro is not there on the female figure. She does lack all the semitones, which would make her more of a three-dimensional figure. We have a disassociation between background and foreground. The narrative is gone. We're not sure what exactly the story is. And the entire scene is rather flat. For the first time in 400 years, we have a painting that does not utilize linear perspective. We do have visible brush strokes in the painting, although they are not visible on the slide. And the painting is the size of a history, religious, or even a mythological painting, about seven feet by eight feet, when this subject matter is supposed to be a much smaller image, somewhere around one and a half by two feet. It is based on traditional Renaissance work, such as pastoral concert, and The Judgment of Paris, both of which by uh, extremely well-known Renaissance artists. So he does um, definitely consult the past. However, he does so uh, using very contemporary figures. Olympia is a painting of a prostitute, again, with um, lacking of chiaroscuro and linear perspective and it again is based on images from the past. Now with Impressionism this is our very first secessionist art movement and a lot of things spur this on. We talked about photography already but this is the very beginning of like the Industrial Revolution, trade with Japan, and we have some really wonderful works here. Manet had developed a following of these very young avant-garde artists who end up being called Manet's Circle. They're going to become the Impressionists, and Manet is even um, asked if he wants to join them, but he does decline the invitation.
Don't forget that the leader of the Impressionists is Claude Monet, and there he is. Now, up to this time, painting utilized what's called local color. So with local color, this is the color that the object is expected to be. We can paint in a studio instead of painting out in front of the object itself. So with the idea that the sky is blue and clouds are white, the grass and landscape, various shades of green, everything looks normal in this painting. The Impressionists have an idea, and with this painting, this is where the Impressionists get their name uh, from Monet's painting, Impression Sunrise. Um, short, quick, visible brush strokes of color, giving the impression of light. Um, but what happens with Impressionism is that these artists paint in front of the object rather than painting in a studio. So the idea that color itself comes from light. When uh, Sir Isaac Newton in 1666 refracts light through a prism, we see that it appears in six different colors. And this is important because with the idea of light changing throughout the day, we have to say that color needs to change as well. In order to paint what we know as perceptual color, this is where we have to paint in front of the object. The term is on plane air. Keep in mind that Impressionism was not embraced when it was first uh, shown to the public. Here you have a police officer keeping the pregnant woman out of the Impressionist exhibition for fear that it would harm, these images would harm her unborn child. Uh, it took about 15 years for Impressionism to become famous. And remember with their Impressionist exhibitions, they really all were failures, both in uh, the number of people that went through, but also um, financially, none of them made any money. Other Impressionists are Renoir, Mary Cassatt, who was an American artist, but moved to France to join the Impressionists. A lot of her subject matter is mother and child or siblings. Degas, who's mostly noted for the use of pastels and also the subject matter of ballerinas. He, like many of the Impressionists, goes blind at the end of his life, and we end up with um, him changing mediums, and we go into sculptures with him. And Berthe Morisot is the last of the Impressionists that we're going to look at. With post-Impressionism, this is not the next generation, but they are later contemporaries of the Impressionists. They're not interested so much in perceptual color as they are in its expressive uses. We also have some artists such as Cezanne who are interested in spatial issues. And none of these artists would have heard the term post-impressionist as it was created after the last of them died, which was Cezanne, and he dies around 1906. Seurat would have been the leader of the post-impressionists. Unfortunately, he died very young from a respiratory illness. And this is his penultimate work, Sunday, on the island of Le Grand Jatte. And it is created through the technique of pointillism. Pointillism is the act of placing pure dots of color next to one another to create the intended color. So, a dot of blue next to a dot of yellow, we're going to perceive it as the color green. Unfortunately, with this painting, it took about two years to complete, from 1884 to 1886. And because it did prove Seurat's theory uh, of color, we really haven't produced much since then because we frankly didn't need to. Paul Cezanne uh, is considered the uh, main person involved with post-impressionism. 
with an image like this with uh, it's taken from it's painted I should say from different points of view that's why the apples look like they're gonna fall off the table and the wine bottle is slightly slightly tilted the table itself looks like it's on two different planes he's gonna be noted as the father of some early 20th century art movements such as Fauvism which utilizes arbitrary color as seen in this early painting and also cubism which you can see how the homes um, in this village are starting to transform into more purely geometric shapes not really trying to capture exactly what Cezanne is seeing but he's more interested in the form of these objects rather than anything else and this is going to spur on cubism Gauguin he deals a lot with primitivism and expressive uses of color, the incorporation of non-Western material, uh, such as these figures from Tahiti, into his artwork. Uh, so it is considered the borrowing of visual forms and objects from non-Western cultures. We have Edward Monk, also categorized as a post-impressionist, because of his use of color. And we also spent a lot of time on Van Gogh. So make sure you're familiar with his family, the three cities he lived and worked in, the time in which he painted, the illnesses, and finally his death. His family had uh, six brothers and sisters and Vincent was the eldest, but the other person we need to know about is Theo. He's gonna be the one that extends the family line and he's the one who also uh, finances Vincent over his time as a painter. In Amsterdam, his paintings are very dark, they're very heavy, very monochromatic. Whereas when he moves to Paris, he gets to meet the Impressionists, learn some new styling uh, techniques and his paintings get happier, very brighter. You can see that short, quick brush stroke, but he's not an impressionist. Um, he is going to be a post-impressionist. And this is the city of Arles where he's most active. He's gonna be producing a painting roughly every 38 hours during his time here. Lastly, he does move uh, in, during the last four years of his life to the city of Auvers after he gets out of the asylum in St. Remy, and he moves in with the family of Dr. Gachet. So he is a post-impressionist along with Cezanne and Gauguin, and he was struck with a lot of diseases, syphilis and Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease gives a person severe headaches as well as vertigo. We have him uh, diagnosed with epilepsy. He had developed lead poisoning. He was a turpentine and absinthe drinker, and he also heard voices. The poor um, was the subject matter of his a lot of his paintings throughout his career. And in this image, he presents himself to you as a peasant. He does a lot of self-portraits. Red Vineyards is the only painting sold during Van Gogh's lifetime. We have uh, Vincent uh, signing uh, his works with his first name rather than his full or last name, as many of the artists do. This is a work purchased uh, locally by the J. Paul Getty Museum. And Dr. Gachet is the most expensive painting ever sold at auction. Uh, Eighty-three and a half million dollars is what that sold for back in 1990, and of course, this is the doctor that cares for Vincent the last few life, few months of his life. He was a homeopathic doctor. The Potato Eaters is considered Vincent's first masterpiece. The Asylum at Saint Remy, and his final painting, Wheatfield with Crows. Fauvism is an early 20th century art movement that begins in 1903 and ends around 1908. The leader of the Fauves is Matisse, and Fauve in French is Wild Beast. 
The cool thing about Fauve's paintings is that they're loud and colorful and very exciting uh, because they deal with arbitrary or subjective color. Arbitrary color is whatever color we want to paint an object. So a tree doesn't have to be green. It can be yellow or blue or brown. It, it doesn't matter. It can be your color choice because of design ideas or motifs or even because it's your favorite color. So um, this is the, uh, these works were first shown in the fall salon and this is the opposite of the normal salon held by the Academy, which would be held in the springtime. So there's Matisse there working on a sculpture. His early works were absolutely perfect. They were very academic and like this one, um, it was many of them were purchased by the French government and they hang in many of the government homes today, government houses and buildings. But by the time we get to 1903, the Fauvist idea has really reigned supreme over his paintings. So again, loud, bright, and colorful works. The green stripe is also called Madame Matisse, which is Picasso's wife. We also have the incorporation of primitivism here, where Matisse visited North Africa brought back some prayer mats and they serve as backdrops for many of his paintings. We also see him incorporating a lot of his sculpture that he's working on into his paintings. And don't forget with Harmony in Red, this is a painting that was repainted several colors. It had been Harmony in Green and Harmony in Blue before we get to the final color, Harmony in Red. It is arbitrary color as both the backdrop and the tablecloth were originally patterned after a white cloth. Many of the artists during this age also worked on the Russian ballets and Matisse is no different, working on the play or the ballet called The Song of the Nightingale. And unfortunately, during the last few years of Matisse's life, uh, he could no longer hold uh, a paintbrush. And so he could manipulate scissors. His studio assistants would paint construction paper uh, with this paint, which is uh, called gouache. It's a mixture of watercolor and chalk. And we have these very large, very dynamic cutouts uh, displayed at many museums. In fact, LACMA has uh, a fantastic one. With Cubism and Picasso, remember the different periods of his life, such as the Blue Period when he's still living in Spain. He's very poor, many times homeless, and he's surrounded by people who he views as victims of society. The lowest part of this time was the suicide of his friend Cassagamus, who you see in the image at the right. During the Rose period, his life has gotten better. He has transitioned to France, and Gertrude Stein has become his patron. The image of the Harlequin in this uh, painting, the gentleman at the far left, is a self-portrait of Picasso. Leo, Gertrude, and Michael Stein, all brothers and sister, um, were early patrons of these artists, such as Cezanne, Matisse, and Picasso. The famous image of Gertrude Stein by Picasso. And this is, again, one of those paintings you absolutely need to know. Um, the Young Ladies of Avignon is uh, a painting of five prostitutes as we're entering a brothel. Um, the scene is not so important as the technique. This is something that has totally transformed modern art. It's been about 50 years since Manet's painting, Luncheon on the Grass, was introduced. And it's arguing what is the best way to paint. But all of a sudden here, we have abstraction, which is something no one really ever thought of before, taking geometric or 
taking organic shapes and making them geometric, changing the color, in this case, muting the color, but also um, incorporating primitive aspects such as the African and Iberian masks, uh, removing linear perspective, and it really is a groundbreaking painting. Picasso kept this private for many years before putting it on public display. One of the people that saw it was Georges Brock, who explained that seeing that painting was like drinking kerosene and spitting fire. Uh, Georges Brock was a Fauvist painter in the camp of Matisse, but then later on became a Cubist painter. And both Picasso and Brock um, are important because they are the ones who lead the Cubist movement. So it wasn't just Picasso alone. What's really great also about Cubism is that it deals with the breakdown of time and space, which is exactly what the theory of relativity deals with. Einstein introduces that in 1905, and we have Cubism in 1907-1908. Picasso and Einstein never met. Um, Ma Jolie, the painting at the left, is our first painting to include uh, words on its surface. There is a spinoff of Cubism called Futurism. It is Italian. And we can see this great uh, dynamic image with the train coming in at about a 45 degree angle. And uh, we also see imagery above the number um, of the train coming right at us. The number, of course, the 6943 is presented on the side of the train. So we're seeing the train itself at various points of view. And then the people beginning at the upper left moving around the front of the train and exiting through the lower right or the middle right of the screen. So we have a very dynamic image. Uh, Picasso was only married once but had many mistresses. Um, Olga Koklova was his wife and was a ballerina. Um, a later mistress was Marie Therese Walker and Dora Maar. Um, Picasso was a huge fan of Manet, uh, and he copied Luncheon on the Grass many times, uh, about 153 times. And the final painting we'll look at from Picasso is Guernica. Guernica is one of those um, extremely large paintings, 11 feet by 26 feet. It is only done in three colors, black, white, and gray. And it memorializes an attack on a Basque village in northern Spain. So we have um, the woman at the far left crying over her dead child. We have some recontextualization in the light bulb up above the horse uh, as a bomb blast. And of course, even the horse is screaming. And the figure down below, if you've taken Survey 1, uh, is very reminiscent of the dying soldier that we see uh, primarily on the Temple of Ephea, but this is also something that is utilized consistently um, in art history. The Armory Show, which takes place in New York in 1913, is the first time that we have Americans seeing <clears throat> abstract art, and it's not something we really understood. Keep in mind that these modern art movements really begin in Europe. They stay in Europe until the Second World War. So a Cubist painting that came to America was Nude Descending a Staircase by Duchamp. Uh, again, it's an abstracted image. Uh, it is a Cubist image, and it caused a lot of not really a sensation like Luncheon on the Grass would, but it was very infamous at this show. Uh, a lot of people made fun of it, saying that it looked like a shingle factory had blown up or that, uh, in fact, Teddy Roosevelt said it reminded him of a Navajo blanket. So it's still going to be about 30 more years before we embrace this new type of art that is coming out of Europe. With futurism, keep in mind this is a spinoff of Cubism. It originates in Italy, which is very unique because all the other art movements are really focused in France and particularly in Paris. 
This is also the first time we have a manifesto uh, written about an art movement. And these people, as we read in the Futurist Manifesto, were into power, speed, mechanization, violence, and war. And this is a great example of a Futurist work. We're at a very modernist angle, looking down on this, on this train passing underneath us. It's got a tank turret, armored. Uh, the train itself is armored. Snipers on top of the train. Wonderful fractured space and uh, arbitrary use of color. Um, unfortunately, most of the futurist artists go off to war and are killed within the first year. Uh, World War I is a horrific war where you have 10 million people killed, 25 million people are injured horrifically. This is the genesis of plastic surgery. Our first war fought in the trenches, our first war with poison gas, tanks, and airplanes. But we do emerge from the war into Dada. Uh, it does have many translations according to its name and where you are. For instance, in Russia, Dada means yes, yes, and across the border in Romania, it means no, no. Um, it also emerges from several cities at the same time. We have very unique artworks coming out of Berlin, Paris, New York, and Zurich. It further asks the question about what art is. It's no longer about how we're producing art, but what is art to begin with? Is it like this guy reciting a sound poem up at the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich? Or is it like Hannah Hawk's photo montage that are very popular in Berlin? Man Ray is an American artist working in New York. But the most famous, of course, is Marcel Duchamp. Now, he gave us that image um, of nude descending a staircase, but he had a very interesting life. He was Hungarian by birth, spent most of his life in Paris, but then once World War II begins, basically immigrates to America and even here on the West Coast, uh, ends up living in Pasadena. He was a cross-dresser and his name here is Rose Selavi. And he's famous for creating ready-mades. Ready-mades are where you take commonly manufactured objects and call them works of art. Uh, basically, the idea of craftsmanship has been thrown out the window. Uh, we don't even need an artist anymore. We can just go out and purchase an item and call it art. The one on the left is an assisted ready-made. The one on the right is for drawing bottles, and that is a true ready-made where no um, change has come to the object from getting it from a store. Now, Fountain is the most famous work of Dada. It is a urinal on its side. And Duchamp um, basically put this into an art exhibit and said that, you know, this is what I'm exhibiting. And it ended up getting thrown out of the exhibit because they said it was plagiarism, that it was a plain piece of plumbing that somebody else created. And he argues that, no, this is um, turned a different way, and so we have a new thought for the object, and it's the artist's choice. What happens here more deeply is that art all of a sudden becomes conceptual, meaning that the idea behind the work is much more important than the work itself. And it's going to set the groundwork for the contemporary art era of post-World War II. Now with surrealism, um, we did the uh, Exquisite Corpse project. And the idea was that these images came from our subconscious. Um, up until now, and basically beginning in the Renaissance, we look at art as a God-given talent. And now we're looking at it, it comes from our own impulses, desires, and fears. 
Andre Breton, he's the guy who gives us the Surrealist Manifesto, and he's kind of the leader of the Surrealists. Surrealism is very much like a club or organization. You could join, you could get kicked out. Um, some famous Surrealists would be Max Ernst, who gives us the uh, technique of frottage, uh, rubbing on a textured surface to create the foundation of an artwork. We have Juan Moreau who has these fantastic abstract figures. Salvador Dali, the most famous of the Surrealists, although he was kicked out in 1936, but he's very much uh, synonymous with that movement. And the most famous image of Surrealism is the melting clocks. René Magritte, who gives us images like this where uh, it says, this is not a pipe underneath the pipe, letting us know that we are looking at a painting rather than a pipe. And we can jump to America real quick. And the idea is that modern art has been going on in Europe for basically 100 years. And when we look at what's being produced in America, it's very old fashioned. It's very dry. And we haven't really pushed the boundaries in art. We have these wonderful uh, American realist or um, regionalist painters, uh, so such as Grant Wood and Edward Hopper. But when World War II hits, a lot of work and artists uh, immigrate here from Europe. And we have the very first American art movement at the end of World War II, which is abstract expressionism. So in 1945, New York becomes the center of the art world. And abstract expressionism is the first American art movement. Jackson Pollock is the leader. And we also have completed this arc that we started 100 years ago. When we look at impressionist works, they are very representational. They look like the natural world. We've moved through abstraction with artists such as Picasso and Duchamp where they've taken an item and, or an object and transformed it into its geometric equivalents. And now we're at what's called non-objective art, which is, for a lack of a better definition, um, paint splattered on a canvas or applied to a canvas. This is, there is no object to these paintings. It is purely uh, aesthetic value. Um, it is a rejection of European ideas and ideals. And we do have various names that these people have been called. Abstract expressionists by far use the most, but also action painters because they are physically involved with the creation of their works. And also occasionally the real ritzy people call them the New York School. Um, each of these artists have their own unique style and perspective. They were all painters. We do not have abstract expressionist sculptures, for instance. And the canvases are not treated. It's just paint applied to a raw canvas. Um, and again, no underdrawing or preliminary drawing. Um, it is the idea. It's kind of like even a, an outreach of surrealism that our brain is telling our arms how to apply the paint is the way they thought they think about this. Um, Non-objective art makes no reference to the natural world. We can only talk about these artworks through the formal elements such as line and shape and color. It is a fairly new term and it's been coined probably about 30 or so years ago. Before that, we used to only have representational and abstract that's why these people are called the abstract expressionists, not the non-objective expressionists. Um, Clement Greenberg is the person who gives us the language of formalism, which is really delving into the formal elements, line, shape, color, pattern, and texture. And it's the only way we can really truly talk about these paintings. As I mentioned, Jackson Pollock is the leader and he's famous for these drip paintings, which are created on the ground. They are also very large, usually about eight feet by 15 feet uh, would be a common 
size for them. Uh, de Kooning, uh, actually one of Jackson Pollock's friends and his image of a woman. Mark Rothko and his landscape images. Don't forget that during his career, his paintings uh, were normally bright and colorful. However, they got darker as uh, we neared his death. Helen Frankenthaler, very similar to Jackson Pollock in the application of the paint, though she does mix her paint with paint thinner, makes it more liquid, and it's more staining the canvas, being absorbed by the canvas. And we also talked about architecture. That was our last lecture together. Um, the skeleton and skin system deals with the way these buildings are constructed. We have a very uh, important core framing, uh, usually like steel I-beams, um, sometimes wood as well, like our, our normal houses are wood framing. And then um, we have a protective covering such as drywall, plaster, glass, aluminum siding over the outside of the structure. The very first modern architecture uh, was created in Europe. Uh, this first one in London to house the very first World's Fair. This is the Crystal Palace sitting on 18 acres of property, uh, 900,000 square feet of glass, uh, created in a period of only nine months. We also have the Eiffel Tower associated with the World's Fair. This is for the 1889 Paris Exposition, the world's tallest structure when it was created. And one more building in Europe we're going to look at is the Villa Savoy by Le Corbusier. This is a, a building that is tied into the international style. Now the international style has seven components, which we look at here. Um, on the ground floor, we have these columns that are representational of the Greek columns uh, of the ancient uh, classical age. We have them uh, appearing to hold up the structure with ease. And this is what we call a non-weight bearing or free floating uh, frontage. And then we have ribbon windows um, along the front and sides. We have a rooftop garden. We have uh, a plain, nondescript, uh, non-ornamented building uh, that uses very neutral colors as well. And it's topped off by that rooftop garden. So there are seven elements. You don't need to know uh, all seven of them for the exam, but you do need to know that this is the international style of architecture, very famous in Europe in the 1920s and 30s. But really when we look at modern architecture, it's almost the exact opposite of modern art. They do start within a few years of one another, but whereas modern art was embraced in Europe and kind of, you know, not so much in America, it is exactly opposite that in terms of architecture. Um, there were a few buildings in Europe, absolutely, but modern architecture really takes hold here in America. And we have the very first skyscraper is the Marshall Field Wholesale Store. Now, modern architecture, besides being starting, uh, besides starting in America, it starts very much in Chicago. So keep that in mind uh, during the exam. Uh, Chicago in 1879 burns down for the most part. We have a grid-like road system, and we have a lack of significant monuments that we have to worry about protecting. In Europe, you have these wonderful old sites and old buildings, and none of them are going to be allowed to be torn down to build like a skyscraper. So in America, that wasn't the problem. It had basically architects had a clean slate. So with this building, even though it's built exactly like the Crystal Palace using cast iron, uh, it is very heavy and it kind of fails as a skyscraper because of that uh, sandstone brick on the outside. It doesn't transcend its environment like it should. Um, there is no verticality that we normally associate with skyscrapers, although when you do go into this building, which you can't anymore because it has been demolished, is that it is 
uh, huge expanses of uninterrupted space. All right, and we can't talk about American architecture without talking about Frank Lloyd Wright. And his contribution is what's called prairie style architecture. And the Roby House is the ultimate home for that. Think of prairies as being very horizontal. There's definitely a horizontality about this building. Uh, it is just so cool and so unique. It is also a home that is uh, situated on a very strange piece of property. It's very long and narrow. Um, the material was from local quarries, a tremendous amount of windows put in to let in natural light rather than having to use artificial light. It is really a fantastic home. Again, make sure to associate this home with prairie style architecture. And as famous as that home is, it doesn't even hold a candle to falling water. Falling water is Frank Lloyd Wright's most famous work. And this is out in the woods in Pennsylvania. It is a home that was commissioned by Edgar J. Kaufman, a very wealthy dry goods merchant and he basically uh, vacationed here as a kid and his this is where he wanted his home built um, and this is a, a summer vacation home for him the only stipulation was that he wanted a view of the river after a couple of preliminary plans that were submitted none of them turned out great they decided to put the home or frank lloyd wright decided to put the home right on top of the river and you can still see uh, the gigantic I-beams that are underneath that lower tray of this home that basically span the river and support the home. Frank Lloyd Wright at this time is in his 60s, and this is actually his most productive time period. The final uh, element on your study guide is the case study houses. Now, these are experiments in residential architecture that ran from the end of the Second World War into the 1960s, but a lot of them 1940s, 1950s, to help with the housing crisis that we had in Southern California of all these returning servicemen. So you have the leading architects of the time taking part, a total of 36 designs created, but only about 25 go to model home stage. And none of them, absolutely none, go to full mass production because this was supposed to be mass produced houses that were inexpensive using commonly gotten material such as steel, glass, and wood. The most famous is the case study house number 22. It's also called the Stahl House, which is the last name of the original and current owners. It is a second generation home and it juts out over the hillside overlooking Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, it is near uh, Laurel Canyon. And if you take Laurel Canyon up the hill uh, and take a couple of side streets, you will get to this house. It is um, an exclusive road, a private road, so you won't be able to uh, just drive by it. And quite honestly, from the street, it, it looks like a trailer. It's plain, it has aluminum siding over the front, there's no windows, but the entire back of the house is glass and uh, a 280 degree view of Los Angeles. And that is where we're going to end our uh, review. Best of luck on the exam.